Thank you for joining us. We hope that you enjoyed today's service. God is using the ministry of Lakeside to make a difference in many people's lives, and we have heard numerous stories of life change. If God has used the ministry of Lakeside to make a difference in your life, we would love to hear your story. Please email us at amen at lakesidechurch.ca. Souls one, cause your face to shine upon us. Stretch your hand to save. Our God never fails. Nothing is impossible for you. And though the battles rage, your blessing. Over the last couple of weeks, we have been working our way through this idea of maneuvering through a maze of difficult and challenging circumstances. And we have been getting our wisdom and our insight and our guidance from a Bible writer by the name of Paul. Paul is in prison at this point. He is waiting trial. The potential outcome, of the likely outcome of this trial will be his own execution in Rome. And uh, he is writing to a group of Christ followers in a city called Philippi. So the letter is to the Philippians. 
and uh, they are going through their own difficult and challenging times. They're facing a lot of the things that we face every day of our lives, but they're facing some more intense persecution from the, the Roman government of that day. And Paul says to them, there are three things you need in order to maneuver through these difficult and challenging uh, times. First thing he said is it's about having the right heart. We looked at it week one. And he says that we need to rejoice. We need to rejoice in the Lord. We don't rejoice. It's not a feeling. It's based on certain beliefs. Rejoice comes from the right beliefs, not the right feeling. He says that we have to remember that the outcome of everything we go through, according to the promise of Romans 8, is that it'll turn out for good. We need to be reminded that uh, when we go through tough times, it produces maturity, it produces completeness. We, he reminds us that we have the power to overcome, and it gets us ready to handle even more difficult and challenging circumstances. And he said, because of those right beliefs, we rejoice. But he just didn't stop, the, he didn't stop at rejoice. He talked about that we need, to, um, we, we need to respond properly. Sometimes we go through difficult times. We don't always um, respond properly to other people. We blame and we get ugly with other people. He said, no, you've got to respond. You've got to respond with gentleness. He says that you've got to relax because God is near. And then lastly, he said, bring your request. Toss your request in God's direction. And then we had that little mantra, rejoice, re uh, respond, relax, and bring your request. And he said, when you do that, you get this peace of God that guards your heart, that protects your heart. You get the right heart. And then last week, Lindsay did a great job in talking about the right mind. And that it's about the information, it's about the input sources, it's about thinking about the right things, it's having the right people pour into our lives, and then it's putting what we know in our minds into everyday action. And he says that if you do that, the God of peace will be with you. Well, today we're going to look at the whole idea of having this courageous sense of, of confidence, that no matter what we face, we're going to have this sense of courage and this sense of confidence to move forward and to walk towards it. Because sometimes life gets tough. And when it does get tough and we have these unforeseen and difficult and challenging circumstances, when it seems beyond our ability to handle, when we feel powerless, when we look at what we're facing and go, I can't handle that, what happens as a result of that is we begin to fear. When you say those words, I can't handle it, you begin to fear. And when you go through difficult circumstances and fear begins to to, to kind of take up residence, doesn't it? It takes up residence in your, in your heart and in your soul and in the pit of your stomach. And it begins to suck the joy right out of your life because of this fear. And it creates those anxious and uncertain moments. And some of you know what I'm talking about because this week you felt that fear. You felt that anxiety. You have felt that uncertainty. And it might be something to do with your health or the health of someone you love. It might be, have something to do with a relationship or job or money or consequences of a poor decision or something to do with one of your kids or your spouse or whatever it is. But you faced something this week and you felt that fear. And fear kind of got a grip and got a hold of you. And it's not that you don't believe in God and it's not that you don't have faith, but fear got a hold of you somehow, even with belief, even with faith. You see... Faith is not the absence of fear. Faith is not the absence of uncertainty or doubt. Faith is the ability to courageously and with confidence walk towards those difficult and challenging circumstances. It's about walking towards that very thing that you fear. And this whole issue of fear has become a battle for me over the last number of months. And I've talked to some of you about it. And I've felt that fear, and I don't like it, and I'd like to get rid of it, and I'd like to do, you know, win the battle over it, and I've tried everything I can, and I've prayed, and I've had faith, and I've done all those things you're supposed to do, and yet I still feel the fear. And so this, this message especially has spoken to me as much as any. And in this next section of Philippians chapter 4, that's what we've been looking at, Paul talks about finding this confidence. He's talking about finding this courage. He's talking about finding this secret. And so let's, let me work it through for you this morning. He says this, I rejoice greatly in the Lord. So he's, he's, he's filled with joy. That at last you've renewed your concern for me. Now, you might read that and he's kind of going, finally. Finally, I had all these concerns and you did nothing about it, but at last you did. That's not what he's saying here. He clears it up. He says, indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. In other words, he says, I know you had the heart to care. I know you, that you, you cared for my needs. 
and eventually you sent something financial, something tangible to meet my everyday life needs. And I'm thankful at last it arrived because the means was there. But it's just kind of a backhanded thank you. It's kind of backhanded gratitude because he says, yes, thank you for this. Indeed, you've been concerned, but you had no opportunity. But he's saying, I'm not saying this because I, I needed it. Thanks anyway, but I didn't really need it. And later on, as he finishes up this letter, he, the last section of this letter, he spends a lot of time thanking them for all that they've done and, and their concern for him and walking along with him. And he said, because you cared for me, God's going to supply all your needs because you've cared for my needs. So he spends that time because I think at first he thinks, ooh, I don't know if I said that right. You know, thank you, but I didn't need it. Imagine saying that at a Christmas gift. He's saying this, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned, there's, I've gone to school, sort of a hard knocks, to be content. I've learned to be content. The word content here is an interesting word. It not, it's not the opposite of discontent. It doesn't mean, well, my needs are met and so I feel good inside. It really is a word that talks about a deep sense of inner peace or quietness. I found this, I've learned this deep inner sense of peace and quietness. Whatever the circumstances, no matter what I face, I've learned that I can have this sense of peace. He goes on. I know what it is to be in need and I know what it is to have plenty. He says, you know what, I've had all of my needs supplied, but sometimes I went without anything. And then other times I had lots. Sometimes life was a bit of a bust. Other times I was blessed. I know. I know what it's like to have a lot, and I know what it's like to have a little. And he's saying, success is not based on how much you have. We live in a world that success is measured by how much we have. He says, that's not measure, the measure of success. The measure of success is, I have learned the secret. The word secret is the word mystery. Uh, there's a mystery. Some people don't get it. He says, there's this mystery of being content in any and every circumstance. I've learned that mystery. I've figured it out. I know what it's like. No matter what I go through, I have this sense of deep-seated peace, no matter what. He says, whether I'm well-fed or hungry, living in plenty or in want. And Paul is basically saying, you see, the secret or the success in life, when you go through difficult circumstances, the goal, the goal is not to have the circumstances changed or removed. We think it is. Paul says, no, the goal is to have this contentment, this inner peace in the middle of it so that we can handle it no matter what comes our way. That is truly the goal. That is truly the goal. But he talks about having this peace. He talks about this contentment. And I think when I listen to that, that no matter what he goes through, he says, I've learned the secret of this deep-seated peace. I think I want that. That no matter what I face, I'd love that inner peace. But sometimes it feels like it's almost unattainable. And Paul says, I know what it's to be in difficult circumstances. But I know, as difficult as they are, I found peace. I found peace. And then he goes on to quote which might be one of the more, most quoted verses in the Bible. He says, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. He says, I can do everything. I can handle anything that comes my way, no matter how challenging or difficult or tough it is. I can get through it. I have the strength to persevere, to endure, to work my way through it, to come through the other side. And I think the most important word is in this, this little verse is the word him. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. You see, when it comes to dealing with difficult circumstances courageously and with confidence, it's how we fill in this blank. I can do everything through blank who gives me strength. And we're not talking about financial security. We're not talking about possessions. We're not talking about all of those things that we turn to in our culture for security. He's not talking about that. He's not talking about a what. He's talking about a who. This is a person. This is a person. And whoever we write in this blank is critical to whether we have courage and confidence. Whatever we write, whose ever name, it could be a name, it could be your name, it could be someone else's name, but whoever's name we put in this blank goes a long way to dealing with the courage and confidence to face whatever comes our way. You see, there's this little um, 
equation that I wrote in your, your, your notes there. I believe confidence comes. We feel courage and we feel confidence when the who, whoever the who is in that blank, has both the character and the competency to handle anything that comes our way. It has to be that character and that competency. It's character and competency, and they must have both. Whoever's name you write on this line, they have to have the character and the competency to be able to handle anything that comes your way. Both are critical. Now, how many of you like to fly? How many of you don't like to fly? Yeah, there's a bunch of hands both ways. Well, you know, to get on an airplane, you know, you have to, you buy your ticket, you walk down that, the ramp, um, and you, you kind of go through that little door, and you walk down the aisle, and, and you sit in your seat, and you put your seatbelt on, and they have the safety announcements, you taxi to the end of the runway, and you take off. You would not do that unless you believed in the character and the competency of the pilot. You just wouldn't. I mean, could you imagine walking in the door and you see the pilot there and you say, hey, are you able to fly the plane? He says, never done it before. First time. You'd be going, hmm, do I really want to fly? Because you wonder. And he's saying, you know what, and I failed most of my exams. You kind of go, hmm, I think I left something back up in the terminal. Because you worry about the competency, Right? But you want to know that he has the competency to fly the plane, and you want to know he has the character, that he cares about your well-being. You need both, or you wouldn't get on the plane. And yet on March 24, 2015, 149 passengers boarded German Wings Airline, Airbus A320. They got into their seats, they strapped their seatbelts on, they watched the safety announcements, they taxied to the end of the runway, and they took off. They believed that the two pilots would have both the character and the competency to fly that plane. But we know how the story turned out. We've watched the news. We've seen how it turned out. Both pilots had the competency, but one of them lacked the character because of a personal struggle with mental illness. And I'm not putting down his mental illness. It was severe. But his personal struggle with mental illness affected his character, and his depression turned into aggression. And he flew that plane into the side of the mountain, killing himself and everyone else on his plane. Some said that in things that they found, it was because he wanted to do it and make a name for himself as he went out. That's an issue of character. One news report said that this had to be a maladapted character defect, a character disorder. Even when someone suffers from a mental illness, this is unusual behavior. He was competent. He didn't have the character it ended up in a crash. And life is like that. Whose ever name you put here, they need to have both character and they need to have competency. And we got limited options. Limited options. You can put your own name there. You can say, I'll do everything through whatever your name is, Dave, who gives me strength. And when it comes to your own name, and when it comes to your own competency, there are some challenging circumstances in life that you can handle. We can be self-sufficient to a point. But there are times when it's beyond our ability to handle it. We cannot be self-sufficient. We don't have what it takes. We're powerless to deal with the difficult situation, especially when it's a health diagnosis, or especially when it's a, relational, a relationship that is ending, or maybe it's a job loss, or something that we have no control over. We don't have the competency to handle it. Some things we can, but only some things. Often life can get outside our control, and we don't have the ability to handle it. I think that's why so many people in our culture are afraid. Because when life is out of control, they can't handle it, and they've been writing their name in there. And they go, uh-oh, I can't handle it. I'm in big trouble. And that just creates fear. But it's not just our competency. Our character is questionable, too. Because research shows that people in difficult circumstances happen to focus on self-preservation and selfish choices. And it'll be all about us. And I think all of us know that it's true. That when it comes to our character and our competency in difficult and challenging circumstances, sometimes we can handle some of them. But there are limited options. But there are other times that we don't have what it takes to handle very chaotic and complicated circumstances. And so if you write your own name there, sometimes you're going to be in trouble. Then you can say, well, I got a friend. I'm going to write his name or a spouse or a parent or whatever. I'm going to tell you. They have the same limitations that you do. The reason so many people struggle in our culture 
with fear and anxiety, and it's almost epidemic at times, is because I think they keep writing their own name here. And they know it's not enough. And when times of difficulty come, they're just filled with fear. Paul says, it's different for me. He doesn't say, I can do all things through Paul who gives me strength. He says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. And the him is Jesus. He's saying, I can do all things through Jesus Christ who gives me strength. Who gives me strength. He kind of says, I can find my strength in Christ. You see, the cause of fear is this. I can't handle this. It's coming up to a difficult circumstance and say, I can't handle this. I'm not competent. I don't have the character. That brings fear. I don't have the power. I don't have the resources. I, I don't have what it takes. I can't handle this. It creates fear. Paul says, that's no problem. I know I can't handle what I face, but Jesus and I can handle anything is what he's saying. Anything that comes our way, we can handle it. Because he is competent and he is the character. I mean, when you think about the character of Jesus, you can't start with his character without thinking about his love. His love is enormous. It's never ending. There is no strings attached. He doesn't, doesn't disappear when he disapproves. It is not fickle or frail like human love. It's a different kind of love. It's a perfect kind of love. And it starts with love. You have to look at his character and think about his love. John, who knew Jesus as well as anybody, maybe his best friend here on earth, and says this, and so we know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in him lives in God, and God in him. In this way, love is made complete in us. Because we have this relationship with God, because we believe that God is the one who gives us strength. He says, in this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence. When you will know that you are loved with that kind of love, it gives you this confidence. He goes on to say this, there is no fear when there's perfect love because perfect love drives out fear. He says, because fear has to do with punishment. He's saying, maybe you're going through difficult times and you think, well, God's punishing me. God does not punish those who are his children. He will discipline. It's different. Punishment is to afflict pain. Discipline is about, to, is about bringing transformation. And he says, the one who fears is not made perfect. In other words, he hasn't experienced that love. When you think Jesus, the core of who he is is love, and that perfect love casts out fear, and out of his love flows his grace and his mercy and forgiveness. He has your best interest at heart, flows from his love. The outcome is always good. It flows from his love. He's faithful, never will abandon, no matter what, all because of his love. And you have this character quality of love, and then you add to that his wisdom. God is, Jesus is the wise Jesus who is God in flesh. I use the names interchangeably. But Jesus is all wise, and, and he asks the question. When he looks at your life and says, what should happen next? He'd ask the question, what's the wisest thing to do? The good thing is he knows the answer. And then he enacts it. Now, sometimes we go through difficult times. We wonder, does he really know what he's doing? It, this doesn't seem wise. This doesn't make sense. But that's because of his wisdom is greater than our, our ability to figure it out. And you take his love that he, uh, he loves you, and you take his wisdom, and they work together. That's his character. You can count on his love, and you can count on his wisdom. And then you think of his competency. He's all-knowing. He knows how the story's going to play out. He knows every twist and turn in the story. He knows, how the, you know, he knows what's going to happen, every choice you're going to make. And sometimes he lets you go through things, and he knows that you're going through it. And he lets it happen because he knows what's going to happen down the road, and he knows why this has to happen for the next thing to happen. And so he's always, you know, he, he, he is... Um, you know, he's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. The Bible says there's nothing too hard for God. There's nothing impossible. There's nothing you go through that he can't handle. Sometimes you wonder, where is he? Why isn't he changing it? Can he handle it? Yes, he can. He chooses not to because of wisdom and because of love. And then he's always present. There's nowhere we can hide. God is always there, always present. Sometimes we don't sense it. Sometimes we don't think he's there. When we go through difficult times, even Jesus on the cross, said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because he wondered. In the middle of pain, sometimes you wonder. But God was present. And you take all of these character qualities and they work together. You've got to have love and wisdom, but you've got to have power. Love and wisdom without power would not accomplish some of the challenges we face. But power without wisdom and love could be cruel. And so it all works together and he's competent and he has this character. And he can handle anything that we go through. 
And that's why we want to write his name in the box. He gives us courage and confidence. The big question is, do I believe God is competent enough and has the right character? Do I? And if the answer is yes, are you willing to put his name on the line? Or are you going to leave your own name there? You had it there before. How did it work so far? And it's all about perspective. And perspective is about focus. And when you go through a difficult time, you can focus on the challenges and the difficulties and the pain and the heartbreak and the heartache, and you can get so focused and you can get overwhelmed by them. And you think, I can't handle it. Or your perspective can be, I can't handle it, but God who is with me, God who loves me, God who is competent, God who has the character, He is with me. He can handle it. Together, we can handle anything. It's about the perspective. There's this little diagram. It's that we all face difficult circumstances. And the difference between fear and confidence is perspective. It's not the circumstances. It's your perspective. Am I alone? Is it bigger than me to handle? You know, is it going to turn out disastrous? I, you know, I'm on my own. That only creates fear. Or do I say, God is with me. God can handle it. I'm turning it over to him. I, don't, I won't always make sense. I won't go down a road where I think it should go. But I'm going to say, he's got it all figured out. That gives us confidence. And the more you do this, the more confident you get the next time, and it's more confident the next time. But if you keep giving into fear, you'll get into that cycle where you'll give, it, fear will overwhelm you. It's all about perspective. A few years ago, I watched a documentary, and uh, it was the story of this bear cub. And they showed the beginning of it, and they showed his mother, the mother bear, laying dead on the road. She'd been hit by a truck. This little bear was just brand new. And the idea you got was he wasn't going to make it on his own. He would be, you know, he, would, he wouldn't be able to fend for himself. He wouldn't be able to take care of himself, and other animals would attack him. And to your surprise, this big grizzly bear comes along, this male grizzly bear, and kind of adopts him as his son. He kind of teaches him how to do things that bears need to do. Teaches him how to fish in a stream, teaches how to eat berries and what to eat and what not to eat, and kind of shows him how to, you know, get insects from behind bark, all those things that bears do. And one day, the two of them get separated. And what you've seen from the beginning of this documentary is that there's been this mountain lion, and he's been eyeing this bear cub as lunch. He wants to destroy him. He wants to eat him. He wants to tear him apart. And when he sees the bear cub all by himself, separated from the grizzly bear, he figures, this is my chance. And he gets in that, that look in his eye that he is going to attack. The little bear cub sees the, the mountain lion coming towards him, and he does what he saw the big grizzly bear do. He stands on his hind legs, and he begins to growl, except it's a little bit of a squeak. And you see the eyes of the mountain lion. He is ready to devour this little baby bear. And you watch his eyes, and he begins to creep, and all of a sudden, he stops cold in his tracks. His eyes go this wide, and he runs off. And you wonder, it couldn't have been the squeak. And the camera pans back. And behind that little cub, you see this. That's why the lion ran. And he roars so that everybody knows that he's there. See, the little bear cub thought he was alone. Tried to go it on his own. Probably would have ended up being lion lunch if he had not. If, if he had tried it on his own. But what he didn't know is that that grizzly bear wasn't too far from the cub. He had kept his eye on him. He was watching over him. He was never far from his father's presence. And that's what God wants us to know today. That no matter what we go through, no matter what's looking to attack us and devour us and wreck us, that his presence is not that far away. In fact, he's right there. And he is competent, and he has the character. And together, you and God can handle anything. There's nothing that you and God can't handle together. And if you believe that, write his name on that blank. And find the courage and confidence you need. But it's not just about this mental perspective. Perspective is important. It's critical. But there's something more to this. And that is that we need to not only have it in our minds... But we need to take action steps as well. And I want you to think about something that you've gone through that's been very fear-producing. Um, maybe it's this week or maybe it's a month ago, and you just felt fear. For me, it's usually a, which one do I choose, not thinking about one. 
but you felt the fear and you've had little, very, little confidence and thought, I can't handle this. And I want you to ask yourself a couple of questions. And this is the first question. Why am I afraid? What is at the root of it? What is at the root of it? Is it that you think, well, this is too big for me to handle. Is it that simple? Or is it something from your past? Maybe you faced something similar to this and it didn't turn out in the past very well and you're pretty much afraid that it's going to turn out the same way this time. You know, maybe, maybe it was a relationship. You were in a relationship and it went sour. And you're in a relationship right now, but you got a little bit of fear. Because maybe there's a few signs that look like that old relationship. You think, oh, it's going to happen all over again. Or maybe it had something to do with a job, and maybe you had a job, and you and your boss didn't get along, and there were some signs, and before long, either you quit or they quit you, one or the other. And you think, my job right now has some of those signs again, and you're afraid. Maybe it's something you've been through, and you're kind of saying, that's what's bringing the fear, because I feel like I'm going through it again. Or maybe it's something someone else you know went through. You know, maybe someone got a diagnosis that you got, and their diagnosis was exactly the same, and they died, and now you're afraid of dying. Or maybe, yeah, maybe it's some relational chaos in someone else's life and it ended poorly and you're thinking, oh, I've got that same chaos, it's going to end poorly. Or maybe it's something to do with a job, money, whatever, but you look at someone else's life and it didn't turn out well and you're kind of afraid because you think that's gonna how, how it's going to turn out for me. Or maybe it's something in your past where you're hurt or wounded or abandoned, abandoned or betrayed and those wounds have caused fear. And it's asking yourself the question, why am I afraid? What's at the root of it? Sometimes we have to dig deep, and sometimes it's not easily uh, obvious. And sometimes we have to get some friends, or sometimes we have to talk to someone else. Find out why. What's at the root of my fear? I've been asking myself that question. Why am I so afraid? Why does this fear come on all of a sudden? What's going on there? Because there's a root. The second question is this. What are the lies that I'm thinking? Because here's what happens. When you start to get afraid, you start to make stuff up. Anybody notice that? In fact, that somebody said fear was false uh, expectations appearing as real. And we begin to kind of, we're fear, afraid of something, and we start telling ourselves lies. And before long, you know, we've got deep-seated fear and anxiety and doubt and uncertainty, and we feel overwhelmed. And we need to know that there's an enemy of God. He's real. He wants to wreck your life, and his greatest weapon is lies. And when you go through difficult and challenging circumstances, he gets into your mind, and he makes it worse and worse and worse until you're overwhelmed with fear. I mean, you know how it goes, right? Your kids have the car. First time. They haven't had, it that mu they haven't had their license long, and they miss curfew. And you're just waiting for the police to knock on the door with bad news. And then they come home, and you love them and ground them in the same breath. Or you get a diagnosis, and you go online, and it seems bad. Maybe you don't even have the diagnosis. You just put the symptoms in. Before long, you're planning your funeral. Or you have a money challenge, and all you see is bankruptcy and losing everything you have. Or you have a relational bump, and you think, this is going to turn out bad. My relationship is going to be in the toilet. I've been there lately. It's not a fun place to be. And we kind of work ourselves into that point of feeling overwhelmed and anxious because of the lies. You need to say, I need to separate the lies from truth. What lies am I telling myself? And so we identify the roots, and we need to identify the lies. And then we need to, thirdly, take a single step of faith. Know why we're afraid. Know the lies we're telling ourselves. And take that simple step of faith towards what is challenging us, towards a difficult circumstance, towards what we're afraid of. A single step of faith, just a simple one. And when you do that, God gives you the power to take the next step. One author calls this the law of the first step. I call it power along the way principle. You take a single step towards whatever you need to, to do, whatever step of courage or, or confidence you need to take towards whatever circumstances you face, whatever fear you're feeling. You take one step and God will show up and he'll give you the power to take the next step and the next step and he'll give you the power to face what you're going through. A couple of, it's a very biblical principle. You know, there's a story in the New Testament. A guy by the name of Lazarus gets sick and he dies. And they bury him and he's dead for four days and Jesus comes along and kind of grieves along with his family because these are, this is one of Jesus' best friends. And Jesus wants to do a miracle and he wants to bring what is dead back to life and he says to them, roll the stone away in front of the grave. 
And they kind of give him excuses how it's going to stink and so on. And he says, roll the stone away. If they never roll the stone, there is no miracle. There is no, there's no bringing what was dead back to life. They had to take the initial step of faith. There's a great story in the Old Testament that really illustrates this. The nation Israel, they had been in bondage for 400 years, and then they got freed, and then they kind of messed up because they didn't trust God, and they had to wander for 40 years. And God's finally saying, hey, it's time for you to go into this land that I promised you, this land of rest, this land of security, this land of safety. Land is very important to Jewish people. That's why they're fighting over this little piece of land today, because of how important land is, because God gave it to them. And they could see the land across the river. But it's flood stage, and that river is rushing, and you get in past your ankles, maybe up to your waist, and you will be rushed downstream, and you will drown. And God says, oh, by the way, today's the day we're going to take that land. And they think, um, how are we getting there? And he goes, just across the river. And I think there's all sorts of fear because they're afraid of drowning. It doesn't make any sense. It's not the route they should be taking. And the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, which is kind of a symbol of the presence of God, they are walking down, and, 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 they, and God says, they have to put their feet in the water. And they put their feet in the water. And I'm sure it got up to their ankles and up to their knees, and they're wondering, what's going to happen? And I think they're afraid that they could drown. And all of a sudden, God parts that water, and they walk on dry ground. They took the step of faith, and God provided the power. And when we take that first step, sometimes God will change the circumstances, bring dead things back to life. He'll part the water, but sometimes he won't. Sometimes he doesn't change the circumstances, but he gives us the strength and the power to go through whatever we're facing. But it starts with us taking a simple step of faith. It says in Isaiah 43, but now this is what the Lord says. He created you, Jacob. He's talking about the people of Israel. Same name. Guy had two names. He says, he formed you, O Israel. Fear not, he says. Don't be afraid, whatever you face. For I've redeemed you. I've freed you, it means. I've summoned you by name. I know your name. That's how close we are. I know your individual name, and, I, and you are mine. It's talking about how relationally connected. This is about your, my, one of my treasured possessions. He says, when you pass through the rivers, what? What's the word? I will be with you. Not that I will part the waters sometimes. Sometimes I won't. Sometimes I'll just be with you as you pass through. Not over, not under, but through. And when you pass through, not over or under, but through the river, they won't sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, not over or under, but through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze because you're precious and honored in my sight and because I love you. And he says, I will give men in exchange for you and people in exchange for your life. He is prophesying the coming of the Messiah, one who will come to this earth and die on their behalf to pay the price for their sin. He says, I'm going to give one in exchange. You think that can't happen, but it can. And then he goes, and don't be afraid. Why? Because I'm with you. And then he talks about this thing that's impossible, bringing all the children together. That's what he's talking about there. And he said, because you've been called by my name, I've created you for my glory, whom I formed and I've made. And he's saying, whatever you go through, the river, the water, the fire, whatever, I will be with you. Anyone in the Bible who had, where the odds were stacked against them and went through difficult and challenging times and walked right through the middle of them had this little mantra, God is with me, God is with me. And when fear not is said, and it's said 365 times in the Bible, the words right after most often are, fear not, I am with you. It's God speaking. I am with you. God is with you. Because God and you can handle anything. Anything. You know, we've seen a lot of racial tension in the United States over the last number of months. It was, it's bad, but it was worse a f number of decades ago. And a few decades ago, a little girl named Ruby Bridges headed off to school. But it wasn't just any ordinary day going to school. She lived in New Orleans, and a federal judge had ordered that all white-only schools had to, had to allow black students integration. And white parents said, if you allow this, we won't send our kids and make it worse. We'll go down, and we will make it so miserable for those black students. They will never want to go to school. And no other black students did but one little girl named Ruby Bridges. And this is a picture of her leaving the school. Two federal marshals in front, two federal marshals behind. And she walked through the heckling crowd. They yelled at her. They threatened her. And yet she arrived on time every day, never was late. One teacher said, I saw a woman spit on her, and Ruby just wiped her face and turned to the woman and smiled. She said, another man 
shook his fist and said he was going to kill her and her family. And she just turned to him and smiled. When she got to the steps of the school, she turned around and she smiled. And she said to one of these federal marshals, I'm going to pray for those people tonight when I go to bed. And a Harvard psychologist named Robert Cole wanted to know where this kind of courage came from. And so he went down to New Orleans and talked to Ruby and talked to her friends and talked to her family. And this guy's not a, a, a Christ follower. He's kind of an agnostic. But he said these words. In, in home after home that I visited, I saw Christ teaching, and they were focused on Christ's life. And all of these things were connected to the lives of these little black children by their parents. He wrote, the religious instruction connects with a child's sense of what is important and what is not. And what he basically was saying is, I think it was Jesus. It wasn't the marshals, it wasn't her parents, it wasn't anybody else, it was Jesus. She knew that Jesus was with her. No amount of human strength can give you the kind of courage it took for this little girl to go to school. Ruby knew that it was Jesus, and he, she knew Jesus had walked a road, and he was spit on, and he had been beaten, and he had punched, and he was, died, and he rose again. And she, she knew if Jesus could, he would walk with her through it as well. And she knew that when she had Jesus, she could handle anything. And so this little girl every day, in spite of all of the obstacles and the challenges and the circumstances, went to school because she knew Jesus was with her. And some of you right now are facing difficult and challenging times. And you're not sure where you're going to find the courage and the strength to deal with it, to endure, to hang in there. And it's about believing that Jesus is with you and he comes with character of love and wisdom and he comes with competency of power and knowledge in his presence. It's about believing that you and Jesus can handle anything, no matter what. It's about writing his name on the line and grabbing his hand and saying, hey, you know what, I'm going to take that first step of faith, believing he is with me through whatever I go through, and I'll believe that he'll give me the power along the way. It's finding peace in the middle of whatever you go through. It takes the right heart, it takes the right mind, and it takes the right courage. And I would ask whatever's causing your fear to think about that and think about just taking one simple step of faith to face it this week. Maybe it's something at work or home or health or money or relationship, child, whatever. It's taking a simple step of faith towards it this week because you know that Jesus and you can handle anything. Because you know that he is always with you. Always with you. He's always with you. He never leaves you or forsakes you. And because he's with you and you know that, you can take that step of faith because together, Jesus and you can handle anything. Let's pray. Father, this morning as we think of the challenges we face, may we be reminded this morning of those simple words that you are with us. That no matter what we go through, you are with us. No matter how hard or difficult or challenging it is, you are with us. You love us, and you're wise, and you're powerful, and you're all-knowing, and you're always with us. And may we have that reality today in our lives. And Father, this morning, as some of us think about those things that we fear, may we just have this clear, clear sense, as this song is being sung, that you are with us, that we are not alone, that we are not alone, but that you are here. And may we grab hold of those things we fear and may we be reminded this morning that we don't have to go through these alone, but we face them with you because you are with us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
I see a light is breaking through. The dark night will not overtake me. I am pressing into you. You know, this morning, if all you hear is those words that Heather sang for us this morning, I am not alone. You go before me. You will never leave me. If we could just remember that, no matter what we go through this week, that we're not alone. We are not alone. But it is turning it over and relying and entrusting it to him who gives us strength. He goes before us. And he'll never leave us. And maybe you're going through some tough times this morning or just want someone to pray with you, whatever you're going through. There'll be some folks up here at the front that would do that at the end. But just let those words ring in your ears as you leave this morning. I'm not alone. You will never leave me. You go before me. And sense his presence this week, no matter what you face. God bless. Have a great week. Thanks so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed this message. To hear it again or other messages, please visit us at lakesidechurch.ca.